Um, first thing I wanted to say is I'm, we're, we're really so happy to be here. Um, this is our first time at uh, LTC, so it's really, really cool to see the community and all the great work going on. Uh, really awesome stuff, just have to say, all around. Um, and so great to just see, I mean, it would have been really nice to see in person people, but it's it's equally nice just even to see all, you know, these, all the folks, all you folks who have contributed so much to eBPF. Um, it's really awesome. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to be talking about protocol tracing with eBPF and what we've done there and just share some of our, some of our experiences. Um, and so before kind of uh, get started, just so a little bit about me. So I'm Omid. Um, I was a founding engineer at Pixie Labs where we started using eBPF uh, to solve observability problems. I'm currently a principal engineer at New Relic. Um, in a former life, I did more stuff with hardware. Uh, but uh, these days, uh, working in the observability space. So um, to kick things off, so a little bit of the history. So we started off in 2019, and our goal was to build uh, uh, no instrumentation observability platform, particularly targeted at Kubernetes. Right. Our vision was let's help developers understand what's happening in their in their Kubernetes apps. You know, things that your applications are running on clusters, uh, it's hard to access sometimes. You might not have the right privileges. Uh, when something goes wrong, it can be really hard to debug. Um, so what set of tools can we give to application developers out there so that they can better understand their own applications um, and figure, on, figure out what's going on when, when there's an issue, a performance issue, a functional issue, whatever it may be. Right. And so our first goal, uh, our first very specific goal when we set out was just to trace application network messages. So you have your, your application in Kubernetes, you have all these different microservices, they're talking to each other. Well, what are they saying to each other, right? And we started off with HTTP, and, and since then we've expanded out to other, other protocols. Um, but I mean, you know, it's the basic idea was still like, how can we see what, what different services are saying to each other? And when building this out, we had two key requirements. Um, the first was that uh, we wanted to be no instrumentation. So we don't want to have people to do code modifications. We don't even want them to have to redeploy their applications. It's really annoying if you have an issue and you have to go modify some code, add some you know, log statement in there or do something you know, just to be able to get the visibility that you want or even to redeploy. It's not always practical. Um, so we want it to be uh, zero instrumentation from the user's perspective, right? Essentially, we're doing the instrumentation for them. Um, and then the second thing is we want it to be low overhead because we want it to be able to leave this tracing capability on in clusters so that it's always active. You take those two pieces, put them together, and I think everyone in this audience would say, oh, yeah, AVPF, right? Uh, that's, that's no surprise, right? No instrumentation. Kind of just be able to trace things automatically and a super low overhead. Uh, you know, obvious answer is eBPF. Um, so our general approach, uh, which shouldn't be a surprise, but general approach is, you know, we want to capture the data in kernel space with eBPF, um, take that data and ship it up into user space, uh, where we have a data collector uh, that's part of the the Pixie Edge module, which is running on the nodes of your Kubernetes cluster, and that would then take care of, you know sorting through all the data, parsing it, making sense of it, you know, figuring out that it's HTTP and, and parsing it appropriately, things like that. And then once it kind of turns that into a structured format, you know, has parsed it out, uh, we would store the data into tables so that um, we would have the ability to query the data. So part of the Pixie uh, platform is also the power of being able to come as a user and look at historically what's been happening inside your cluster and query it. And so there's a powerful query engine as well and a UI to figure all that stuff out. Uh, run all the queries that you want to run. Um, the focus of this talk, since we're, you know, this is mostly focused on eBPF, is going to be at the bottom end of the stack. So we're going to be talking about what we did with eBPF to actually collect the data um, and uh, do the protocol parsing and things like that. Um, I wanted to give some context, like we'll get into the details, but I just want to give people a taste so they under really understand what we're talking about here is like what the end experience is, because we actually have something working now. Um, so the idea is you can go in through the UI and we've already traced all the data, 
Uh, we've all traced all the HTTP transactions, and you can just go run a query and say, give me all the HTTP transactions on the cluster for the last five minutes, for example. And when you do that, the sort of view that you get, you can get the raw data, you can see the time when a, a transaction went through, a request went through, the pod that generated the HTTP request, uh, what the other endpoint was, so where was that request going, and then we get full body visibility as well. So it's not just the metadata, but we actually see the contents of the HTTP message as well. So we see, oh, somebody to post to the payment auth, and here's the JSON body inside, here are the headers, uh, here's the response, you know, you see a response that, you know, response 200, so everything was okay, and what was in the body of the response. So we give a, a wealth of information to the application developers so that they can figure out what's going on in their application. Um, on top of that, then once you have that raw data, it's not too much of a stretch to, to you know, take that data and turn it into automatic service maps so you can kind of see who's talking to who within your application, how much bandwidth are they using, um, if there's any errors on those connections, like are there any HTTP errors, all that sort of stuff we can kind of automatically get once we've collected all this data with, with eBPF. And then the last kind of contextual slide I have here to just give the big picture is, um, you know, we also have the ability, because querying is very important for us, we also have this thing called a pixel script, which lets you go sort through the raw data that's been captured with eBPF um, uh, using a pandas Python-esque query language. So you can do things like filter out if you're looking for only HTTP requests that are going to a particular path or, you know, um, are have an error in them or, or had a high latency or whatever it may be, you can kind of have the full power of a, of a query language to do those sort of, uh, do those sort of filters and kind of get the information that you're trying to get to. So with that context, I um, want to kind of go a level deeper and talk about our experience with building this protocol tracer. Um, so when we set out again, as we said, we were kind of new to the space. We, we were kind of saying, okay, so where should we trace the data? Um, we, there was many options in the software stack, right? So you have the application at the top, but then below that you have the, essentially the protocol library, like the HTTP library. Um, you may or may not have SSL in your application, and then you get into the Linux uh, kernel where you have your, essentially your Linux API, you have your syscalls. And then, you know, socket layer, TCP layer, you know, and, and the stack goes down all the way down to the network driver. And so um, we were looking at the different options. We were considering, hey, should we do it with U probes at the library level? Should we do it with K probes at the um, syscall level? Um, should we use an approach similar to, you know, libpcap where you're going down lower in the stack? Um, we kind of came from the perspective of we wanted to be as high as possible to the application layer, um, just because kind of that was the context we were coming from. Um, you know, we were trying to do application performance monitoring, so um, that's where we come. That's where we're kind of leading towards. But we wanted to evaluate all these options. And so when we looked at all the options, um, we kind of evaluated them on a number of trade-offs. So. We looked at things like, um, and these are just some of the high level trade-offs we considered, but like tracing overhead. We, you know, and I'll show some data on the next slide, but we you know, felt pretty comfortable that with eBPF we'd get fairly low overhead with, with all these approaches. Um, another thing that we considered is, so what about the scalability and stability of the eBPF code that we generate? And, um, that's the one where, like, when we started looking at U probes, you know, it quickly became apparent to us that if we try to use U probes to target libraries, um, it would be a significant development effort because we'd need to develop U probes for every library that's out there, which for HTTP is really, I mean, there's so much out there that's almost impractical. Um, and even if you do build them, like, how do you make sure, I mean, software evolves, right? Libraries evolve. So, how do you make sure your probe targets? can evolve with the code that exists out there. Now, we'll come back to this uh, later on in the talk because we end up using U probes for certain things. So that's kind of why I'm hinting at that right now. But um, clearly, if you go with K probes or libpcap kind of approach, um, you have a lot more stability uh, and scalability of, of writing your eBPF code. Um, and you get the nice same benefits with uh, a libpcap based approach as well. Um, from a Parsing effort, um, it actually turns out that the higher up the stack you go, in some sense, it's, it's easier 
um, because you're directly accessing the data that you care about. If you really care about the HTTP request, that's you're going directly after the source. Um, if you trace at K-probe level, you're getting pretty much the send and receive tr transactions that are going through, um, and and that doesn't necessarily line up. We're kind of getting the raw data. You have to parse parse it out. Uh, so you need to develop protocol parsers to figure out, make sense of the data that's being sent and received. And then uh, libpcap, it's kind of similar. Uh, you have to do a little bit more work in terms of the packet processing as well, because you're getting essentially you know packets, uh, not just the protocol layer. Um, and then one last consideration that, um, again, another one we'll get back to for later on in the talk, but we also were interested in SSL tracing. Um, that's another benefit of doing things at the U-probe level is that you're actually able to access the clear text if you need to, versus once you're down at the K-probe and flip PCAP level, the data is all encrypted, and so you can't really make any sense of it. So looking at this landscape, um, what we decided to do was we, we thought the right trade-off was to go with K-probes. Um, you know, the U-probes, again, the scalability and stability thing was, was really the, the big barrier there. Um, and then between K probes and libpcap, it was you know it was a little bit closer, but we were coming from the perspective of we want to do application performance monitoring, so we thought, hey, let's go for for the K probes. Um, we did do kind of a rough, quick and dirty study to kind of see what the overheads are uh, of these different approaches, um, or, or a variety of different approaches. So what we had is this is a like a, a simple HTTP server we, we deployed, it really does nothing. It just, you send it a request and it'll immediately kind of like send a, a simple response back. So it doesn't really do any work. Um, and we had it there and we hit it with as much traffic as we could. So we're, we're trying to hit like peak bandwidth for this HTTP server, right? And then we wanted to say, hey, hey what happens to this HTTP server once we start probing it? Does its throughput go down? Um, and so, we had this set up, we had this jig, and then we started deploying different sorts of probes on it. So we deployed K probes on the send and receive calls of that server to see what happens to it. Um, and that's the blue line. And what you're looking at in this chart is, um, so I should explain the chart first. So on the um, X axis, what we have is the work per request. So that's saying like once the server received a request, um, did it do any work? Like at the left-hand side, it's really saying it just sends a response immediately. It didn't really have to compute anything, which is not very realistic. Most servers are actually doing something like they have to return some JSON, so they have to go get some data, fetch some stuff, make, do some computations, um, maybe access some databases, who knows what. Um, so not very realistic at the left end of it, but it's kind of the extreme point. And as we move over to the right, it's towards more and more realistic applications. And so when we look at, and the y-axis is saying how much performance versus the baseline when it hasn't been probed at all. So how much loss did we get in the um, throughput of the server just by probing it? And so the blue line that we're looking at is the K probes and at the very left-hand side where it was, you know, it, it's running at peak bandwidth, it doesn't really have any work to do. So it's just like immediately responding, adding a probe to that, uh, even a K probe, Obviously, it's a little bit costly because it interrupts the execution of the program for a little bit, and it's it's because it's really doing no other work that becomes noticeable. But quickly, as you start getting the server to do some some actual real meaningful work, uh, we see that that overhead kind of goes away and it goes to pretty much zero. We're pretty much the same as as if it was not probed at all. So we're running at one hundred percent. To kind of model the libpcap approaches, we tried both TCP and T Shark, and you kind of get a very similar. Uh, profile at the low ends, it, you know, it hurts a little bit, but um, as you move towards the right, uh, the overheads become less and less. Um, so pretty awesome as well. Um, you know, if you look kind of in the, the area between like, uh, the, you know, on the x-axis between 100 and 200, you kind of see the K-probes are a little bit more efficient. Um, uh, but, you know, it's, they're all pretty, pretty awesome in our opinion. Um, and then U probes, U probes were, you know, take a little bit more of a hit um, because you're interrupting the execution of the program and, you know, the context has to change and things like that. So it, it's a little bit more of an overhead there. Um, but our main takeaway from this stuff was that the K probe overhead can be very, very low. Um, and we weren't too, uh, like, we were pretty thrilled with that. Like, we could take the K probes and, and 
we felt we could deploy them in real applications. Um, I should also mention this experiment, we are actually doing the, at least for the K-probe and U-probe, we were actually doing the HTTP parsing as well. So once we captured the data, we did have the prober parsing out the HTTP request to kind of make it realistic. Um, so that kind of validated our, our approach of going with K-probes, at least from a performance perspective. Uh, there's clearly trade-offs. Um, so, so, okay, we decided we wanted to go with, go ahead with K-probe and give that a shot. Um, and so the Pixie data collector, which is codenamed Sterling, um, so just a little bit of background of, about that. It's written in C++. Inside uh, the Pixie data collector or Sterling, we use both BCC and BPF traits, so we're super, um, you know, thankful for those projects. Uh, you know, we couldn't do it without those. Um, there's the huge community effort on those things is, is, is really so awesome. Um, for the protocol tracer in particular, um, we use BCC uh, because we needed a greater degree of control for all the sorts of different things that we wanted to do with our probes. Um, in other parts of Pixie that are not related to protocol tracing, we actually use BPF trace because that's the better fit. So we kind of, depending on the, the circumstance, we, we use both projects. Um, from a requirements perspective, um, for us, we don't really get to control the target ecosystem because we're developing this for uh, you know, the whole community and people are on, on all sorts of different environments. And so uh, we just drew a line in the sand at some point and said, you know, the minimum kernel version that we're going to support is 4.14. Unfortunately, that comes with a whole bunch of restrictions uh, that I'm sure everyone here is aware of. You know, we have the 4,000 inst uh, 4, instruction limit. That makes us very unhappy <laughs> or sad, rather. We wish we had more. Um, we don't get to use awesome new features like the ring buffer, uh, which, you know, again, we would really want to. Um, we've looked into like libbpf and uh, CORE, but that also like we don't, we're not, we can't, because we can't control the target ecosystem, it doesn't seem like that's at least right now um, uh, going to work for us, but it may be something that we reevaluate in the future. Um, so let's get into, so with the framework and kind of the, the basics aside, let's talk a little bit about the architecture of how the uh, Sterling or the Pixie data collector works. So we have, um, so on the left-hand side, what we have is what we're trying to monitor. So we have a target application. Um, it's going to be talking to the Linux kernel. It's going to be performing a whole bunch of different syscalls. And uh, at the high level, what we do is first we set up probes on all the networking related syscalls that we care about. So we're going to we're going to add probes to connect, accept, uh, you know, send and all the different flavors of send and receive and so on and so forth. And um, whenever these uh, syscalls are made by the target application, we're going to uh, trigger and run our BPF probes. Um, and then once our BPF probes run, they're going to extract a whole bunch of information uh, that's relevant from that syscall. Um, things like we're going to want to know what the PID is. We're also going to want to know what the file descriptor is because that's essentially, we use the file descriptor to know, essentially keep track of an entire connection. Um, and the first thing we do is store all this metadata into a BPF map, which we call the, the connection info map, uh, which is indexed by PID and FD that uniquely identifies the connection for us. Um, then looking at the data, so whenever there's send and receive, we're processing information in BPF. We have some basic rule-based classification filters. So um, we're going to look at the traffic a little bit in BPF with very simple rules, and I'll show an example of that a little bit later, um, to try to see what sort of traffic it is. Is it HTTP traffic? Is it not? Um, and if it meets the traffic, like if it's a type of protocol that we're actually interested in, um, if it's going actually... Uh, if it's in the address family that we care about, like we'll filter out things like Unix domain sockets, things like that. Um, we'll get rid of all that. But if it's in an address family, like uh, essentially INET or INET6, then we're going to say, okay, this is something interesting and we actually want to ship this information out into um, user space. And so we send the information out through uh, two perf buffers, one for control events, one for the, the data, and then it goes out into user space. And then um, in user space, we have this concept of a connection tracker. Um, the connection tracker keeps all the metadata, and then we have a buffer of all the data. And then we uh, accumulate all that stuff and then start parsing it. And we start parsing the data you know, uh, according to the protocol into structured messages that we then store in tables for future querying. 
So that's the basic architecture and right, it just all works, right? I mean, we, we didn't run into any problems at all. Everything was smooth sailing. Uh, and this is the end of the talk, right? Um, yeah, of course, uh, no, that's not how things go, right? Um, uh, so, you know, the benefits were we did avoid the complexity of the network layer, um, you know, and then we did get easy correlation of events to the process ID. So it's very easy to access to say, okay, this traffic was for this process ID for this file descriptor. Um, but we, you know, for those benefits, we took a whole bunch of different set of challenges. Um, so the first thing that we realized is, you know, dealing with the variety of syscalls that are out there and the way that they get used. And, you know, oh, as we evolved over time, and I'm sure we're not done with these, but we've had bugs where like, oh, something uses a syscall in a, in a slightly different way that we didn't know about and we're not tracing it properly, right? Um, so that's one set of problems um, that we're, we're working on. Um, finding the remote endpoint address. Uh, we'd like to extract that information from BPF, but it's not always possible. Um, which I'll get to as well. Um, the implementation of protocol inference in eBPF is another challenge um, uh, because of the low instruction count and other reasons. And then um, other things we'll touch on is how we dealt with stateful protocols like HTTP2 and gRPC, and then the question of encrypted traffic. Um, so challenges of tracing the syscalls. So, the tracing the syscalls was ended up being a double-edged sword for us. The benefit was that it's a super stable API. It made our probes very portable across kernel version. We love that part of it, obviously. Um, the con is that over the years, many different ways of doing the same thing have evolved, and we don't get to control what applications decide to do. So obviously, we just have to. We're observ we're in the observability space, so we have to account for all of them. Um, today, we trace. A total of 17 syscalls to try to figure out what the application is doing. Um, and, and the list is essentially here. There's a number of connection, kind of what we call connection management sort of, of syscalls, so things like connect, accept, and close. Um, then you have uh, receive variants, so things like read and receive and receive message. Um, an analogous ones on the right side, um, with, and there's one extra one of send file that, we, uh, that is also uh, plays a role. And then we more recently have, you know, kind of started going from the syscall layer down into the internals a little bit more. Um, and so we do look at occasionally at the socket layer. And so we'll look at sock alloc, sock send message, and sock receive message. Um, more specifically, some of the challenges, uh, some of the interesting cases rather um, that we ran into. So the first one is, um, with read and write syscalls, uh, you can use them for both file I.O. and sockets. Um, and so because uh, you know, socket traffic could go through these syscalls, we have to probe them. Um, and we uh, originally, we would end up with a lot more uh, data than we would want to have. And we would try to find different ways of figuring out how to kind of filter this information out. Um, our latest solution is actually we, we now start looking at SOC send message and SOC receive message on these when we have a read and write. Um, you know, we see if there was a follow-up SOC send message or a follow-up uh, SOC receive message to know whether that read or write was actually used to send information to um, the socket or whether it was used for some other purpose, which we don't really care about, and then we filter those out. Um, another interesting one that we ran into um, was accept. Uh, you know, we accept you can actually call it with an argument to say, uh, you know, ask the kernel, hey, kernel, populate the, um, the remote endpoint address there. And we were using that to actually trace what the remote endpoint was. Um, uh, however, certain uh, applications can choose to leave that that argument as null, which is essentially they say, we don't care what the other endpoint is. Uh, we're going to accept a connection, but we don't need to currently know what the, the um, essentially the IP address and port on the other end is. And so that caused an issue for us because we were counting on that in, in some instances to actually figure out where this communication is talking to with our probes. Um, and so the solution that we've gotten to, at least currently, is we now trace, uh, again, going down a little bit deeper into the socket layer, uh, we trace sock alloc as well um, as a follow-up to an accept to figure out where the, uh, the remote endpoint is uh, so as to figure out that information. And then um, 
The last example of an, you know, a challenging case for us is with variants of send and receive that are like things like, like send message or send M message and receive message and receive M message. Um, these are essentially scatter gather um, send and receives and we have to loop over the data. Um, you know, the BPF, I mean, we can't have an unbounded loop in, in BPF. And so we do actually put in a loop that we unroll, um, but there's only a certain amount of times that we can unroll it within our BPF instruction limit. And so um, we're, you know, we beyond that, at this point right now, we actually just lose the data. Like we can send some metadata saying we lost the data, but uh, we won't be able to get that, that data beyond a certain number of, of loops. And we've run into cases where, um, you know, there's been like 30 with Go, some Go applications. There's been these, you know, send messages with 30 different buffers in it. Um, so, so these things do happen. Um, another challenge uh, that I talked about earlier was was how do we resolve the remote endpoint when we were not able to capture it? So, you know, on the previous slide, I said we try to use SOC alloc to get the remote endpoint, um, but there's also this case where um, Pixie deploys after the application, right? The application that we're trying to monitor may have been up before we deployed onto the cluster. And uh, there may be long-lived connections and we start seeing the traffic halfway through, we ha would have never seen the accept call at the beginning of time, right? Or beginning of that connection. Um, and so for this one, we actually have code in user space um, to try to figure out the remote endpoint. So, you know, we have the file descriptor, we do know the file descriptor, we get the inode number of that um, file descriptor um, from, from looking at proc, and then we use Netlink to kind of figure out what the remote address for the inode is. Um, it's a little bit tricky actually because it's a little bit more complicated than the picture I have here because um, file descriptors can get reused. And so when our user space code wakes up and goes and looks at that file descriptor, it might not actually be the right file descriptor um, that we want to look at. And so we actually have this kind of state machine inside of Sterling that's kind of looking and saying, okay, I'm gonna probe this at multiple different times and actually confirm that this is indeed the file descriptor that um, I actually wanted to find the remote endpoint for and I'm not mixing up or confusing things there. And this is all just from, from file descriptors getting reused and we don't have a unique way of getting um, the remote address for an old file descriptor. Um, if, um, you know, if, if uh, experts in, in this community know of a better way, this has been a little bit of a hassle for us. If there's a better way to do it, obviously, um, you know, we'd, we'd love to learn um, how to do that. Um, so the next kind of, some kind of just walking through some of the interesting cases or, or challenges that we've, we've gone through. And the next one is um, protocol inference. So I said earlier, we don't want to send everything up to user space. Um, we'd like to be able to filter some stuff out uh, that we're just not interested in. And so today we have some eBPF side protocol inference. Um, it's just a filter. So it's okay to have false positives. It's okay to like send some stuff up to user space that we shouldn't have. We'll detect that in user space and essentially send the signal back to BPF and say, hey, we weren't interested in that data and shut that down. Um, but you know, where possible, we'd like to be able to just say, don't even bother sending this up. Um, and so we really just have some basic rule-based um, code in the BPF, and it's very simple. We'll look like look at things like uh, when we, you know, a sender or receive, we'll look at the contents, the beginning of the buffer, and we'll say, did it start with HTTP? If it did, that looks like an HTTP response. That's the uh, you know, H every HTTP response starts with that prefix. Um, or we'll look for, you know, GET, is it a GET or a POST or, you know, other um, commands in the HTTP protocol. Um, so we have started collecting, um, you know, we start tracing this stuff and have collected a little, a small data set of uh, different traffic patterns. And we do run our BPF um, inference rules on these different uh, patterns that we have to kind of to validate how well these rules are doing. Again, false positives are okay, but we'd like to be able to, to classify the traffic um, as well as we can. And so we have a confusion matrix here on the right, which is just saying, like, if it was MySQL, how many percent of the time did we actually classify it as MySQL with the rules that we have? And for, you know, simple cases, it actually does pretty well. Um, there are definitely misclassifications and definitely this data set that we were starting to grow can get a little bit more mature and, and rich. Um, so we have more examples. 
Um, uh, but it does, you know, overall, it, it seems to do pretty well. When it, it thinks it's post Postgres, you know, 98% of the time it gets it right, right? Um, and so, um, you know, we're pretty happy with it, although we do face a challenge now with, as we grow the list of protocols, we've been running into more and more cases where it, you know, these simple rules aren't really um, scaling as well. It's like, once you especially getting start getting into binary protocols, they start looking a little bit similar to each other, or uh, the rules are hard to construct in terms of how you infer that uh, some traffic is Kafka, for example. Um, and so we are still actively thinking about this part of like whether we should keep it in BPF or whether there's some other thing that we can do, um, or whether we have to just start moving this code into uh, user space so that we can do more complicated things. Um, as a follow on to that, um, just wanted to point out that we do have um, part of the architecture, we have pluggable protocol parsers. So once the eBPF protocol inference says, yes, this looks like traffic that's interesting and we want to trace it, um, it gets shipped into uh, the, the connection tracker that I was talking about earlier that um, holds all the data and the metadata. And then based on the protocol that we've classified it as, we'll ship it out to uh, protocol parsers, which will parse it out according to the, you know, we think it's HTTP, we'll parse it out as HTTP, put it in a structured form, and then hold it in a table for future querying. Um, and then, so we're trying to make it easier to have these things be pluggable so that uh, if there's a protocol that we don't support, the community can come in and actually uh, contribute as well and plug in a, a protocol parser um, into, into Pixie and get, get the visibility into the data that, that they're interested in. Um, and so we're working on that. Um, you know, obviously Pixie is open source, so we're trying to include a better contribution guide for how to contribute protocols specifically, um, so that um, if if because we get a lot of requests of like, hey, do you support this protocol? Do you support that protocol? And we well, you can see the list of supported protocols today on the right. Um, there are still protocols that are um, not yet supported and people are interested in. Um, so that's kind of where we stand with the kind of the basic uh, protocol tracing that we have. So summary, that part was based on K probes. We were able to grab all the data that we're interested in from the K probes from the, the Linux syscalls and um, you know, running them through protocol parsers, we can actually get a lot of the data that we're interested in. Um, but there are a few cases that we've run into where K probes are, don't work, they're, they're not enough. So this is kind of a net, another level of challenge that we've, we've faced. Um, and so the two examples here are tracing gRPC, uh, which is built on top of HTTP2, and uh, TLS. So let's jump into those. Um, so the problem with gRPC and HTTP2 is that HTTP2 in introduced a, um, a, a compression scheme called HPAC. And essentially what HPAC says is, um, like, let's say you send a request and it has a path that says at the, in the diagram at the bottom, you can see it says path API get user. You know, the first time it sends that request, it'll actually send the string over, but it will also essentially store that information in a dictionary so that any subsequent times this same string is used, it can send this header, essentially, header string is used, it can actually send um, a, just a encoded value for it. Um, and the, you know, HPAC is, is more sophisticated. I mean, it does essentially this, but it's a lot more sophisticated and optimized than, than this, but you, it's just to kind of demonstrate the idea. Um, and the problem for observability is if we deploy, you know, Pixie deploys and we start looking at the traffic and we see like, oh, there's a header that has value 87. It's like, well, that doesn't mean anything to us. What do we do with that, right? But it's, it's pretty important um, for the community, if they want to be able to see the transactions within their Kubernetes cluster, the path, for example, is a very important field to know what's actually happening in, in your application. Um, so we really struggled with this one for, for a long time, you know, trying to go back and forth and seeing what we want to do with this sort of, this, uh, this, this case. Um, uh, you know, we thought, hey, maybe we can try to learn the dictionary. Um, you know, we, we started going that path a little bit and realized quickly that that's way too complex to try to learn it and we're not going to be able to do it uh, robustly. And 
I mean, there's always a situation where you know you learn the dictionary, and then I mean we send our data through perf buffers. So what if one event gets lost, and then we essentially uh, have to relearn the dictionary from there because we may have missed some important information. Um, so that didn't really seem to pan out for us. Um, we thought about, hey, is there any way to recover the dictionary state via the U probes and kind of then, and then keep that state so that we can decode the the traffic that we're tracing with our K probes. And um, you know, you know, studying the code of the gRPC library that we were looking at, it looked pretty complex. Um, and so in the end, what we decided to do is just the best we were able to come up with was, hey, we just going to trace the gRPC library directly via U probes. So we're not even going to count on K probes in this case. Um, we're we're just going to go straight to the source to get the data. So I mean, I showed this diagram at the very beginning where we kind of were considering the different um, points at which we can probe the traffic, and we said we wanted to go with the syscall K probes in most cases. But essentially, what we're deciding to do here is we're saying, uh, okay, that actually didn't work for gRPC, and um, so we're gonna we're gonna bump it up and go to the you know HTTP two library in this case. Um, so we've currently implemented this for Golang's gRPC library, and we have others planned, uh, but it only works on uh, Go gRPC, which also demonstrates one of the problems with doing, you know, library U probes is the development effort is obviously kind of an order of magnitude higher because you have to uh, support all the different libraries that may be out there. Um, and I should point out that obviously anything lower than the K probes would also have suffered from the same problem. So we really didn't have a choice uh, choice there than other to go up. Um, at least, at least what I mean specifically is going down the stack wouldn't have helped, right? Um, so our takeaways from the so we ended up doing it. It was a lot of effort. Um, you know, our experience from it is like it, what keeps me up a, up a little bit is like, you know, what if we run into another protocol that has stateful information like this? Um, you know, compression on individual messages is okay. We're not concerned about that. But if there's dependent state within a connection, uh, like the HPAC algorithm does, you know, a message that you've seen before affects how you can decode a message, a previous message. Um, that's kind of an issue for us uh, or, or an issue in general for any sort of kind of probing. Um, and so, uh, we're always on the lookout for that at this point. Um, fortunately, all the other protocols that we've had to um, uh, implement so far haven't run into this problem. Um, and then um, the UPRIB-based approach, um, I mean, we already kind of touched on this, but it is hindered by the, the scalability problem. So that's the other part that is, is really annoying is that you know, we need UPRIBs for every gRPC library. If that gRPC library um, you know, changes something, changes a, uh, uh, the function or a, the layout of a struct, uh, we have to take care to kind of adapt to that and make things stable across versions. There's some things like if they change the function name, like we're, you know, completely restructure the part of the, the code that we're probing, that's, that's going to be pretty um, difficult. Um, but if they're just changing structs, we actually wanted, like, we, we didn't want to have to hard code anything. And so we wanted to see if there's a way we could make that that part more robust. And so uh, what we actually count on to make that part more robust is uh, we actually count on debug symbols. Um, I'll point one out, we'll talk about the debug symbols next, but I just want to point out one other thing. The other interesting one is that uh, Go 1.17 was just released. So in Golang, the new version of Golang, they've actually changed the calling convention. And that's uh, another case where U probes, uh, the U probes that we've developed actually, like that requires maintenance. So that's just another example of why U probes are, are, you know, our initial decision to kind of try to stay away from U probes as much as possible, that kind of validates it because we're learning that, you know, things change and U probes are just uh, very difficult to maintain. Oh, and, yeah, and, and if there were trace points, obviously we'd use the trace points, but, but we didn't have access to those. Um, so making U probes more robust, so what have we got here? So like I said, if, if a function that we're trying to trace completely gets restructured, we're out of luck. But we, we said, hey, what if the function is still there, but it's the layout of a particular struct has, has changed? What can we do to try to make that more robust? And so what we actually do, inside of uh, the data collector is that, so let's say, for example, we're tracing this function called write data padded, which is in the HTTP2 library. Um, we're going to deploy a probe to that, and that's going to trigger a BPF program. So first thing we do is we have our, our BPF program is out there. 
Um, but we're also going to go, and with uh, Sterling, we're going to go read the debug symbols of that gRPC library. And we're going to take all the dwarf information, and we're actually going to figure out where the offsets of all the interesting fields that we want to read um, from the function call are laid out. And we're going to take that information. Um, that's step number three. We're going to essentially, for every PID that we discover that's running this library, we're going to populate uh, a map that says, for this process ID, here are the essentially offsets of the different fields in the struct that you're interested in. And so when the BPF program actually gets triggered and runs, it's going to consult that, um, that, that map and it's going to say, where are the offsets within the different structs and where is everything located so that our BPF program actually runs correctly for uh, different versions of the gRPC library uh, without breaking. So if the, GR the Golang folks you know, change again, uh, they add a field into a struct, our stuff won't break. It'll be robust to that. Um, and this is a, a short code snippet that kind of just shows, uh, you know, kind of what it looks like. So we have a probe on this right data padded um, function. So the first thing we do once we get in here is uh, first we get the the uh, tgid, and then we use the tgid to look up this map, which user space should have already populated, that tells us where all the offsets are. And so the arguments, for example, we want to know where stream ID or end stream or the data, where are these things located um, within, uh, where are they located on the stack, uh, where are different struct offsets, all these sort of information, it's already all there. Uh, so we check that that information is there. And if it's, it's only after we've confirmed that we actually have the correct information that user space has already populated all this stuff, do we continue with the rest of our probe and we use these configurable um, offsets coming into the, the BPF program. Uh, another approach would have been to kind of, you know, deploy new, like recompile BPF code, like kind of for every target that we have to kind of build uh, a new version and kind of compile in. Um, but that just would have been a lot more effort in terms of just every time we have to kind of rerun a compilation. And so we thought this, this approach worked well for us. Um, SSL tracing. Oh, looks like I'm uh, a little bit running short on time. So I'll, I'll go quickly through this. Um, yeah. So, S yeah. Um, yeah, it's actually two past eight. Oh, it's two. Uh, okay. We'll love for the audience if they like the opportunity to ask some questions uh, yep. to you. Um, so, anyone, if you have questions, comments, feedback, please speak up now. Hey, thanks for the presentation. Um, I was wondering if you're using any of the information from Pixie for like um, security, policy enforcement, um, stuff like this. Uh, not yet. Today we're, we're uh, focused on just observability, right? But you can imagine that um, with the query language and everything that we have, like with all the data that we're collecting, um, you know, there, you can take that data and then run queries or do the analysis and kind of do uh, sort of analysis of uh, security leaks or you know affecting policy and things like that. Um, today, if you look at the open source project that's out there, um, uh, that's not there. But certainly something we, we've thought about. Okay, thanks. So there's a question from Dave. Did you try it with HTTP over quick traffic? <laughs> We haven't, uh, we haven't, yeah, quick, quick is one that we're aware of. Uh, we have our eye on quick. Um, it's not uh, something we've gotten to yet. Um, uh, there's going to be certain challenges with quick, um, but we, uh, so we're watching it and it, it doesn't seem to be as prevalent. Like I know in certain uh, organizations, it's more prevalent. It doesn't seem as prevalent in sort of the uh, general space that we're in, but um, we're certainly have that on the roadmap for, for supporting quick. So there's a question from Andre. Uh, please pick up. Yes, so you raised your hand. Hi. Yeah. Uh, so on the question of you probing gRPC and like the instability of the interface and all this stuff, uh, have you considered wor working with like all those uh, gRPC libraries to add USDTs and sort of standardize on USDTs across like different libraries? Then you would have to implement it essentially just once. Obviously, you would have to yeah. discover all that, but like the the protocol would be more or less fixed, right? And it's actually extensible yeah. over time. Yeah, that's a fantastic suggestion, and yeah, that is something that you know we do want to go ahead and and do. There's this catch with us, which is 
Um, and unfortunately, the Golang community is a little bit more future looking, but there's this catch with us, which is like we can't, con you know, we're a tool for others. So we can't really control what version of Go they use. And sometimes we just have to go to the lowest common denominator, which is really annoying for us because we'd love to be able to use, just put in USDTs into that code and just use that and you know, kills all these problems, like you said, that we have with you know, things changing. Um, but be because we have to kind of build to the lowest common denominator right now, we, we have to take on this complexity. Um, but the, yeah, you're absolutely right. Like we, you know, they should have USDTs in there and, and it's something that we should probably invest some time working with them to put those in so that everyone can benefit. 